Good afternoon, everyone. We will now call the March 7th, 2022 board meeting to order. Mr. Gaither, will you please call the roll call? Yes, Madam Chair. Representing Educational District 1, Ms. Katie Howard. Present. Representing Educational District 2 and Board Vice Chair, Ms. Aretta Baldwin. Present. Representing Educational District 3, Ms. Michelle Limpiadas. Present. Representing Educational District 4, Ms. Jennifer McDonald. Present. Representing Educational District 5, Ms. Erica Mitchell. Present. Representing Educational District 6 and Board Chair, Ms. Isha Collins. Present. Representing Educational District at Large, Seat 7, Ms. Tamara Jones. Present. Representing Educational District at Large, Seat 8, Ms. Cynthia Briscoe Brown. Present. Representing Educational District at our seat nine, Mr. Jason Estevez. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you so much. I will now entertain a motion to approve the meetings of the minutes of February 2022 board meeting. So moved. It's been properly moved by Cynthia Briscoe Brown. Second. It has been second by Tamara Jones. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Is there a motion to approve the March 7th board meeting agenda? So moved. It's been properly moved by Cynthia Briscoe Brown. Second. Second by Jennifer McDonald. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Dr. Heron, will you please bring the work session items for today? Thank you, Madam Chair. We have five presentations today. First, Dr. Katika Lovett, Assistant Superintendent for Student Services, will provide the COVID-19 public health data update. Following Dr. Lovett, Dr. Sarah Romack, Coordinator of Fine Arts, and Dr. Quell Arnold, Director of Extended Care, will provide a board member requested presentation on the arts. Following Drs. Womack and Arnold, Mr. Al Pacino Hogue, Senior Strategic Advisor to the Superintendent, will provide a presentation on family engagement. Following Mr. Hogue, Ms. Cheryl Parker, Interim Director of Summer and After School Programs, and Dr. Katika Levitt, Assistant Superintendent for Student Services, will present on summer programming. Finally, following Ms. Parker and Dr. Levitt, Ms. Lisa Bracken, Chief Financial Officer, will provide the monthly financial updates. Dr. Lovett, we are ready for your update on the COVID-19 COVID public health data. Thank you for approaching uh, the, the dais and also good afternoon to your team as well. All right, thank you, Dr. Herring, and good afternoon to Board Chair Collins and members of the Board of Education. We are here today to go over our health services COVID-19 update. And of course, the agenda will start there. The purpose is to provide public health data updates and an overview of the district's expanded COVID-19 mitigation strategies. Particularly today, we're going to start by talking about the updated CDC guidance and the public health data associated with that guidance. We'll also talk about our mitigation measures, including surveillance testing and vaccination data. We'll also recap a bit regarding test to stay and isolation and quarantine guidance. And we'll end by talking about COVID-19 communications. At this time, I'll invite up our district's epidemiologist, Ms. Juliana Prieto, to get us started. Good afternoon, everyone. So we're just going to go through a quick epidemiology update. So the most recent epidemiology report from the Fulton County Board of Health continues to show that Fulton County is seeing that downtrend of COVID-19 cases. And this is something that we're also seeing among the population 18 years and younger. So we see that cases reported between the time frame of February 10th to February 23rd were lower than the two weeks previous to that. And we also see this when we look specifically at APS cases. So we see that downward trend where we saw that peak back in early January. So recently CDC announced new COVID-19 indicators that could be used to make informed decisions regarding mitigation strategies for COVID. This include masking protocols. These new COVID-19 community levels considered three measures and are a representation of how COVID-19 burdens the community and the healthcare system. COVID-19 community levels are broken down at the county level and are categorized as low, medium, and high. 
So as you can see on this map, most of the counties in the state of Georgia are in the low or medium category, which is great for us because that shows that that transmission is really decreasing and it's not causing that burden on the communities or healthcare systems as much as it was early in January. And looking specifically at Fulton County and DeKalb County, as of March 3rd, 2022, both counties were at that low community level. So based on CDC's recommendations, at the low community level, they continue to recommend that people stay up to date with their COVID-19 vaccines and boosters. They also recommend that individuals continue to follow recommendations for isolation and quarantine, including um, eating tested if they have symptoms or if they've been recently exposed to someone. Um, and then at the low level, universal masking is not re recommended for everyone while indoors, but people may still choose to wear a mask based on personal preference or based on personal health risks. Um, CDC also recommends that community levels um, continue to um, provide prevention strategies such as making testing and vaccination available in the community, as well as making sure that ventilation systems are up to date in indoor spaces. So we'll talk a little bit later about how APS is contributing to these strategies. And just as a reminder, CDC and the Department of Public Health continue to recommend that people who have been recently exposed to COVID-19 or people who have tested positive for COVID-19 continue to wear a mask for the full 10 days. All right, thank you, Juliana. At this time, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about how this relates to our APS mitigation strategies. Let me catch up on my slides. Okay, here you have the factors that we considered in looking at updating our mitigation strategies. Of course, we made mask optional beginning March 1, and that did line up with the new information from the CDC. But in addition to that, there were also some factors, and I just want to share those factors here. We had a significant decrease in COVID-19 community transmission in DeKalb and Fulton counties, and that we're expecting that trend to continue downward. We also had a decrease in positive COVID-19 cases among APS students and staff. Of course, we finished the final installation of our air purifiers in all APS classrooms, and that was effective 228 22 We continue our COVID-19 surveillance testing, and we also offer ongoing vaccination partnerships, vaccination events in partnership with Fulton County Board of Health, CORE, and Viral Solutions. I did mention that beginning 3-1, we did update our strategies, and here are the strategies that we did choose to make some updates to. We moved to a mask optional policy in all APS buildings and school buses for all faculty, staff, students, and visitors. We also removed the mandatory testing requirement for students participating in athletics and extracurricular activities. And finally, we shifted the mandatory testing for employees from twice weekly to once per week. Now, Juliana mentioned there will be some instances where masks are still required. I won't go back through that full piece here, but just to note that individuals who, have, who are ending isolation are still required to wear a mask. In addition to that, I just want to point out a few things that we will continue to do as it relates to our mitigation strategies. We will continue to follow our existing surveillance testing schedule at schools and district offices. Again, employee testing has shifted to once per week, but we will continue with a twice a week offering for individuals who choose to take advantage of that. We continue to offer the optional testing for students, and we also offer the test to stay program. We will also continue isolating individuals who have tested positive for COVID-19. We will continue contact tracing and quarantine for exposed individuals who are not vaccinated or not participating in our test to stay option. We will continue hosting vaccination events with our health and community partners. We continue to encourage physical distancing when possible, and we continue to encourage staff and students to stay home when sick. And finally, I just want to point out this piece with the mask optional climate. We do recognize that some students and staff may prefer to continue wearing a mask while indoors. It is not required again per the CDC, but we do support this decision for individuals who choose to make that decision for themselves. So with that, we encourage members of our community to just continue to respect everyone's right to mask or not to mask. And of course, APS will continue to have masks available for students and staff who may need them. 
Finally, I want to talk a bit more about our school-wide guidance, which has been updated as of March the 4th. For all schools that are planning to host special events, we're asking that they continue to adhere to the COVID-19 health and safety guidance that the district currently has in place. And then based on that internal capacity, this is already in place for schools, but schools would have to predetermine the number of attendees who can occupy venue settings and only plan for and sell that set number of tickets. That, in that information remains the same. The changes here for the indoor and outdoor event guidance, activities and events should be limited to two to three hours, six feet physical distancing for adults and three feet for adults, I mean for students, and finally, that masking piece we've just lifted here as well, encouraging people to just show respect for those who are continuing to, uh, who have made the personal choice to continue to wear masks. All right, at this time, I'll bring up Dr. Hilders to talk more about our surveillance testing and vaccination updates. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So I just wanted to go over our surveillance testing and vaccination updates. If you look at our trend, we are trending at a significantly lower positivity rate. So our positivity rate um, most recently is at 0.06 positivity for our students as well as staff with surveillance testing. We, when you look at our student vaccination rates as of 228-2022, overall as a school for student vaccination rates for the traditional schools, we are at 29%. But overall, as a school district, we are at 28% student vaccination rate. Our charter and partner schools are at 25%, but again, overall, as a, as a whole school district, we are at 28%. Our staff vaccination rate as of 228-2022 was at 55.7%. So overall, as a, a school district, our staff vaccination rate is at 50, roughly 56%. And this is just to show you when we um, had targeted events, we did home games and these are our totals for our home games. You'll see those clusters, those clusters were identified as low vaccination rate clus um, clusters. And we had great participation when we really look at those targeted events for those home basketball games. We continue to do our vaccination events. We had close, uh, a cluster vaccination event at four of the cluster locations. Now that number is 43%, but that's pretty much letting us know that when we look at a cluster-wide event, not necessarily targeted, but cluster-wide, um, those numbers are not gonna be as high because it's not necessarily targeted areas, but just to offer vaccination opportunities for those who are still interested in receiving those um, first and second dose or the boosters, making sure that we still have it available for those individuals. Now, when we look at our more targeted um, vaccination events, we recently had a targeted vaccination event at, on Saturday, which was at Hollis Innovation Academy. We had a total of 54 individuals, and that um, event was from 10 to 2. We had 54 individuals vaccinated, first, second dose, as well as boosters, and 35 of the 50, 54, I'm sorry, 54, I stand corrected, 54. 35 of the 54 that were vaccinated were APS students, and that was across not just for the Hollis Innovation Academy or the Washington Cluster, but for all APS students. We have two more uh, um, targeted vaccination events um, um, this month. Cleveland Avenue, I'm, I'm sorry, Cleveland Elementary School is the, one, the last one on the 26th, and then we have one at Thomasville Heights, which is one of our charter and partner schools, so we do offer vaccination events to our Chart and partner schools as well. And when you look at the vaccination, student vaccination rates, Thomasville Heights has a 1% student vaccination rate. So we really are trying to target that particular um, community and Hollis as well as Cleveland have 6%. So again, targeted um, student vaccinations are what we're trying to promote so we can get those numbers up for those particular locations and those low uh, vaccination rate clusters. And then just want to just share again with you, we have our updated communication um, website. All of our updates are for COVID are on this website. We also have a weekly newsletter that communication is pushed out every week for our public as well as our communities, um, our parents and staff and communities. And then we also have our own course guide that has been revised and has the most updated information as well. The information was released as of February 9th. And we also have that information in Spanish as well. So, and without further ado, Dr. 
love it if you want to close us out with okay. the Q&A. Okay, thank you. And I'll just end with how we started. We do remain committed to the health and safety of our students and staff. You can see that our presentations have shifted in nature as we are focusing on all things prevention and intervention. And so we will continue those efforts. You'll hear more about vaccination events and our targeted events as we continue throughout the remaining of the school year. So with that, I thank you for your time and we will pause here for your questions. Um, thank you for that presentation um, and for detail about the guidance. Um, I do have a question about the, um, the change in the CDC guidance and the timeline for resuming some sort of more normal food service. Because um, we've been hearing a lot from students that have not been receiving the kind of nutrition and options that they need. And, um, so the question has come up, you know, when can we open up the, the steam tables and buffets? Um, for the children, mm -hmm. and is there anything preventing us from doing that now? Uh, that's a very mm -hmm. timely question. Thank you, uh, Board Member Jones. We've just spoken about that, actually. Uh, Mr. Hoskins, did you hear the question? Um, because we're, we're prepared to respond to that. Um, I, I would just ask Mr. Hoskins to give a, a, a brief update on that, and then I'll share that out as well with the full board this week. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the specific question. Would you repeat that, please? Yeah, no problem. Um, uh, the question was, um, in light of the change in the guidance, when would we be looking at um, resuming some more normal food service um, mm -hmm. delivery? Mm -hmm. um, Starting next week. So we can expect to see, you know, the steam tables and the buffets maybe come back into, into play so that we could have different options. Yes, um, starting, we met with our food service provider last week in anticipation of um, this particular announcement, and so they're gearing up to start next week um, with getting a little bit closer to meals, <clears throat> meal styles and preparation that we saw prior to COVID. Yes, that's great news. Thank you so much. You're welcome. That was just a timely question. Yes, ma'am. That was my question, yes. so um, thanks, Tamara. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. uh, I, I, not only have we heard it from the students' voices from our breakfast with the board, but there's uh, a lot of parents who really rely on us to, um, to make sure their children can eat during the day. Um, so thank you. Thank you for Perfect that timing. That was an earlier time. conversation today, so thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions, Jason? Thank you. That, that was not my question, but I'm glad I know the answer now. Um, thanks to Larry and your team and, and uh, Dr. Love and your team for the air purifiers in the classrooms. That's incredibly helpful and um, I think puts uh, a lot of minds at ease as you go mask optional to have air purifying, purifier systems that are quality and the ones that are in classrooms uh, appear to be very much that um, and I know that the operations team took some time to go through several different versions of different purifiers to find the right one uh, so I, I think that's that is a, a great addition um, I had a question about uh, testing and then positive cases so when there's a positive case just to make sure nothing has anything changed in the last week or so? It didn't sound like it based on your presentation. Correct. But if a child is found positive or a teacher is found positive, the same things happen. You have two tracks, vaccinate, vaccinated, not vaccinated, and then to, can you just clarify just to make sure nothing's changed? Yes, of course. Um, so yeah, that has not changed. So we're still following the CDC recommendations for isolation and quarantine guidance. So once we identify a positive case, we take into account any previous infection. That's important to mention because they may have tested positive previously. But if they have not, and if this is a new infection, um, we do the regular contact tracing where we take into account who was near that person, what's considered a close contact. Um, if they are not up to date on their vaccines, or if they are not in the test to stay program, they are not able to um, continue in, the, in school, they must quarantine at home. Um, and then one clarification as well, if they are exposed at home, 
they are not eligible to participate in the test day program. So they have to be vaccinated or they have to quarantine at home. And that is a, a DPH um, guideline as well and a CDC guideline. So not much has changed on that end. We are looking to see how it may change in the future, but as of right now, it's still the same. Great, thank you. And then on testing, um, I know it's optional testing, mm -hmm. but how does that work with students? Are you still taking them out of the classrooms and taking them to test? Can they, are you telling them you don't have to go? How, how does that work? Okay, so in terms of student testing, it is still optional. Of course, if a parent opted into testing, we are continuing to do the testing. So unless a parent chooses to opt out at this point, the testing has continued. And like I mentioned earlier, we do still offer testing twice a week. So that is still available, it's particularly as many people have chosen to become mask optional or not wear the mask. We wanted to make sure that was in place. So we are continuing the testing program as was set up before for students. Okay. That's good. Um, I'll be interested to see how many tests we have over the next month. Same here. <laughs> no questions? I just have one question for clarity, just going to your response to Jason. So if a parent wants to opt out, what is the process, you know, what is that process? Okay, so the same process, uh, basically when they sign up for testing, there's a piece on the consent that basically says if you choose to opt out, it lists some individuals that you send that information to. And it is a part of what's posted on the website with our consent form. So they just follow that same process from before where they just send the information. We receive that and we remove those students from the testing roster. Things. And then my second question, I don't know if you touched on it, it was one of the slides where you said there were still some instances where we are mandating or strongly encouraging masks. Can you talk about the, those specifics, please? Yes. Yes. And just to clarify, this isn't an APS stance, this is still a CDC and a DPH guideline. That. So um, if you have recently tested positive, so a student or staff recently tested positive for COVID, they have to do their isolation. So five days at home. If they decide to end their isolation after five days, they can return back to school or work, but must continue to wear a mask for the full 10 days. So that's 10 days after either their symptoms started or 10 days after their sample was collected if they had no symptoms. The other instance is if they've been recently exposed. So again, they have the option to quarantine at home if they don't meet those guidelines to continue in person. But if they choose to end their quarantine after five days, they still have to wear the, the mask for the 10 full days after that exposure. So those are the only two instances right now where they need to wear a mask. Of course, we recommend that individuals continue to wear a mask if they have symptoms, but if they have symptoms, we also want them to stay home and monitor them to make sure that it's not something else. Because it's not always COVID, there could be something else out there. Mm -hmm. So we wanna make sure that people just stay up to date with their health. So using that example, ju just using what you say, an example, child is exposed, say on a weekend, mm -hmm. they stay home that following week, those five days, Monday through Friday, they come back to school. The following Monday, they will only have to wear their mask for the additional five days? Correct. Got you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Inclusive of the weekend. Right? Inclusive yeah. of the weekend. Right. So it could be possibly shorter, but yeah. five, but the mm -hmm. five days once they return. Yep. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank any, you. Any other questions? Ron. No, just kidding. Thank you guys so much. You're really appreciate Thank you. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for everything. We really appreciate it. And as they, uh, and as they run or skip, depending on, right, skip, right, depending on the um, emotion that is tied with this presentation, I do want to pro professionally in the audience of our peers thank uh, Dr. Lovett and her full team, you all, throughout the duration of this entire process, uh, they have been professional, diligent, patient, graceful, and uh, well-informed, and they have helped Atlanta Public Schools in that same regard. So I do want to, it is not over, I'm fully aware of that, but even as I sit today for the first time, minus the partition, we, there is, I know, right? <laughs> uh, there, are, uh, there are still changes that we acknowledge, so it's a reminder of us shifting. Thank you to the full student support services team. This is what I, what I want to do. They have been extraordinary.
Uh, our next presentation is a board member requested presentation um, uh, um, from the arts. Uh, Dr. Sarah Womack, coordinator of fine arts, and Dr. Quill Arnold, director of extended uh, 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 summer and after school programs, or I think I have uh, extended programs, will be presenting, and I think Dr. Selena Florence, our associate, um, our associate, I'm giving everybody new titles, our <laughs> assistant <laughs> superintendent for teaching and learning, I think is here to introduce. So team, good afternoon, Dr. Florence, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, board chair Collins, board vice chair Baldwin, Dr. Herring, board members. Um, I'm introducing to you Dr. Quill Arnold, who is the Director of Academic Enrichment Programs. Thank you. Which includes the arts. And um, we have pr provided a presentation for you to give you an update on where we are with fine arts this school year. So I will bring them up at this time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Whoops. So good afternoon, Dr. Herring, Board Chair Collins, and board members. The purpose of this presentation is to communicate an update on the fine and performing arts programs in Atlanta Public Schools. As the arts coordinator for the past five years, I'm excited to share with you today. We'll discuss our program elements with a goal of supporting arts rich schools, as well as our accomplishments and future considerations. At the conclusion of the brief presentation, I hope you will agree that in order to achieve our goal of developing the whole child, it is vital that our students have equitable access to the arts so that every learner can lead a choice-filled life. In the pursuit of an arts-rich school district with arts-rich schools, we strive for arts instructions in three areas. Curricular arts with certified arts teachers, strategic arts partnerships with arts organizations and artists, and arts integration with core content teachers. As you can see in this visual, these three elements are equal in importance and with proper implementation will result in arts-rich schools. First, the curricular arts are standards-based courses in the four arts as taught by our outstanding arts teachers, some of whom will be here tonight to celebrate March as Arts in Our Schools Month. An example of curricular arts is learning the five positions of ballet. It's arts for art's sake is an essential human right. The standards of service list best practices for schools and can be found in the appendix. They generally include 40 minutes of instruction in music and 40 minutes of instruction in art per week in elementary school and offerings of band, choir, and visual art in middle school and high school. Extended arts classes could include dance, theater, film, media arts, orchestra, keyboard, guitar, and music technology. Our general arts courses are offered at the elementary level will prepare students for more rigorous instruction um, at the middle and the high school levels. Principals have the autonomy and flexibility to alter arts offerings in grade level, course offering, and instructional minutes. However, the arts courses must align with the cluster plan and signature programs in an effort for students to complete an arts pathway, which is three credits in one arts area as well as the arts diploma seal, which can be achieved with pathway completion, an additional arts credit, 20 hours of arts-related community service, and a capstone project. Any change from the guidance and the standards of service should be in collaboration with the respective associate superintendent as well as the arts office. Data regarding arts offerings in each school, as well as arts progressions in each cluster and district-wide statistics can be found in the appendix of our recently completed arts audit. It reveals some positive news and some areas of growth. Over the course of the past three years, in most areas, we have increased the percentage of schools with arts programs offerings at each grade level. Additionally, we have seen an increase in enrollment in all arts areas in all, at all grade levels. Overall, there has been a 6% increase in student enrollment in arts classes from school year 2018-19 to school year 2020-21, even with a decrease in total student enrollment. The improvement is even more drastic when we specifically look at middle and high school arts classes. Students, in most cases, elect to enroll in these courses. 
For arts classes in secondary schools, there has been a 55% increase in enrollment in the previous three school years. I credit this positive shift to the establishment of cluster-wide and district-wide student programs, an increased level of equipment and supplies for students and teachers, meaningful relationships with arts partners, technology-based curriculum resources for every arts area, content-specific professional learning, advocacy opportunities for performance and presentation in the community, our incredible arts teachers who inspire passion in our students to realize their potential in the arts and a mission to remove any potential barrier for participation in our programs. The audit also includes visuals that detail each cluster's arts progression. The colors are indicative of each arts area and the colored cells show which arts courses are offered at each school as evidenced by student enrollment in Infinite Campus for school year 21-22. The goal is a sequential program of arts um, classes from elementary school to middle school to high school in each arts area. So as you can see, this is the Carver Cluster. Visual art in the Douglas Cluster, as you can see, is vertically aligned from grade level to grade level. You can see similar opportunities in the Jackson Cluster. For the Mays Cluster. for the Midtown Cluster, and the North Atlanta Cluster. The South Atlanta Cluster. The Therrell Cluster. And finally, the Washington Cluster. The next two slides reflect the same information. It's just in Word format instead of the colored chart, if you prefer that method. So these are for Carver, Douglas, Jackson, Mays, and Midtown. And then the next chart is for North Atlanta, South Atlanta, Farrell, Washington, and Beston CSK. The audit also showcases data for each of our schools. For example, long middle school's enrollment in arts classes is shown here. A 10% enrollment threshold details a stable arts area. Through the pandemic, our teachers have modified their instruction to ensure student access to arts programming while following district guidance for student safety. Supplies and equipment did not prove to be a barrier to participation. Teachers arranged drive-through pickup events for art kits with paper and paints or modified their lessons to include pots and pans instead of rhythm instruments. Digital curriculum resources were provided for each arts content area to ease the reliance on paper materials. Our in-person performances and presentations pivoted to virtual displays, which not only allowed us to showcase arts learning, but also provided access to family and friends from near and far. We leaned on arts organizations and partners through technology that our students would not have had the opportunity to work with in typical times transportation was no longer a barrier. While nothing compares to communal art making, our teachers and students continued to persevere through the pandemic roller coaster and continue to do so. Usually as part of curricular arts, students with special needs are taught alongside their typical peers in arts classes. In addition, we have one music therapist and one adaptive art teacher that support our elementary self-contained classes in a 30 to 45 minute group session once a week for one semester of adaptive art and one semester of music therapy. 
For next year's budget, we have collaborated with the Department of Special Education in a request to fund three additional music therapists and three additional adaptive art teachers so that elementary, middle, and high school students with special needs will receive music therapy and adaptive art throughout the year. Appreciating and showing knowledge of diverse perspectives and in cultures is inherent in the arts. Our students don't perform a piece of music or create a work of art in a specific medium without acknowledging the context from which it is rooted. Additionally, our standards in each arts area specifically call out the importance of how diverse cultures influence the work of artists of the past, as well as the present, and the work of our students. For example, when students from young middle school per, per, were preparing to perform Once on This Island, an understanding of the culture of the Antilles was essential for a quality performance. Additionally, just as with diversity, social and emotional learning is inherent in the arts. The arts are social. In our arts classrooms, one can see the interactions between students and the decision each student makes in the course of being part of a group. The arts, by their very nature, are also emotional. One cannot look at a work of art, like the ones that you see displayed here today, or hear a piece of music, like you'll hear tonight, without being emotionally connected. Furthermore, all SEL competencies directly relate to our four artistic processes of creating, performing, presenting, or producing, responding, and connecting. As shown on the slide as one example, the SEL competency of self-awareness easily translates to our refinement of artistic works, which requires discipline, self-confidence, and collaboration. Our arts classrooms are safe spaces where students learn from mistakes and build relationships with their arts teachers. In elementary schools, for example, our music and art teachers have the opportunity to impact student learning for six consecutive years. We are a consistent force throughout the tenure of a student's matriculation. The second element essential for arts-rich schools is strategic arts partnerships with arts organizations and artists. These partnerships are formalized around a few initiatives that I would like to share. The first is CEP, which launched 17 years ago to make sure that every student received one cultural experience in Atlanta venue at no cost to our families each year. The purpose and learning outcomes have been established between APS and the city's Office of Cultural Affairs. We're one of the only cities in the country to invest in this kind of partnership, where the venue raised funds to provide the experience and APS provides transportation at a cost of about $250,000 a year. This year's field trips are truncated due to the shortened field trip window and the capacity of venues due to the pandemic, but some of our past, present, and future venues are shown here on this slide. Another project developed in the past two years in an effort to connect students to practicing artists, the APS Artist Collab Project offers an opportunity for teaching artists to collaborate with our arts teachers on experiences to engage students in standards-based instruction. The experiences can be a one-time master class, a sharing session, or a residency program. Most projects culminate in an artistic product or a showcase of learning. Over the past two years, we've completed about 70 APS Artist Collab projects. One example is the Found Art Inspiration Project at Boyd Elementary. The art teacher collaborated with a local artist to lead students in the creation of puppets in the style of author and illustrator Ashley Bryan. Students then develop their own stories with their puppets as the main character. Also, in an effort to provide support to teachers and expand the learning opportunities for students, we've partnered with the Georgia State University School of Music and will partner next year with the Atlanta Music Project to offer specialized music instruction for students. This year, as part of their graduate teaching assistant duties, a Georgia State Masters of Music student is working with some of our band programs for 10 hours per week. The teaching assistant provides private lessons and sectional rehearsals, as well as supports student learning during group instruction. The first year of this partnership was a rousing success, so next year we are adding an additional graduate teaching assistant to the rotation to further support student growth. For next school year, we have proposed a new project, 
AMPED and APS with the Atlanta Music Project to provide specialized instruction for band, choir, and orchestra. AMP's mission is to empower underserved youth to realize their possibilities through music and typically provide after-school, tuition-free, and intensive music lessons. AMP's teachers are highly trained performers on their respective instruments and will provide one-on-one -on -one and small group lessons to our students during regularly scheduled band, choir, and orchestra classes. Our arts organizations and practicing artists partners routinely provide professional learning for our teachers. Whether it's the Alliance Theater offering allyship training, which asks teachers to challenge assumptions, acknowledge biases, and establish a culture of genuine equity, inclusion, and justice in their classroom, or Little Kids Rock, who includes the concept of modern band to build music programs as diverse as the students they serve, our arts organization partners encourage teachers to stretch their imagination and reignite their creative flows to inspire our students learning with a focus of collaboration, action, and sustainability. Our next professional learning day, March 21st, our art teachers will collaborate with the Zucott Gallery at the Blue Hair Nature Preserve to gain an understanding of how nature inspires landscape artists of color. Zucott Gallery will feature some of their artists' work emboldened by landscapes and nature. Teachers will then make their own art, learn about historically significant black landscape artists, and develop lessons to inspire their own students. Students will then create their own artwork inspired by nature and choose to participate in an art exhibit juried by the owner of the Zucott Gallery. All in all, we cannot accomplish much without our partners. We had a, a wide array of access to community and national partners that impact student learning or when we're in need. The third and last element essential for arts-rich schools is arts integration, standards-based learning in an art form alongside other subject areas. It focuses on engaging students in a creative process. For example, performing on an instrument to learn about sound waves meets both music and science standards. Arts integration is not arts enhancement, using arts strategies to learn another subject. One example is singing the ABCs to learn about the alphabet. Students aren't learning about music concepts, but they are learning about the alphabet through music. In the area of arts integration, we've linked our CEP opportunities to other content area standards so that teachers can provide context to each venue experience and connect real world applications to concepts and skills. We also work with the Woodruff Arts Center and the Kennedy Center Partners in Education Program, which provides arts integration support to cultural venues and school districts around the nation. In addition, we support schools in their implementation of STEAM and arts integration strategies. One example of this support is with Harper Archer Elementary School, where we collaborate with the leadership to provide artists and residents at each grade level, as well as professional learning for teachers and arts-based opportunities throughout the year. Hayes is surely developing into an arts-rich school with curricular arts taught by art teachers, arts partners offering artists and residents to the schools, as well as in our cultural venues, and arts integration with classroom teachers encouraging the standards of core content alongside art standards. So, in summary, our recent accomplishments include increased enrollment in arts classes, especially at the middle school and the high school levels, continuing quality arts instruction through the pandemic, embracing all students and diversity, increased partnerships with arts organizations in our community and across the country, as well as practicing artists and a further exploration of arts integration. For future consideration, the arts audit provides a numerical snapshot of our progress in areas of need, but we will further develop a measure of the quality of our programs to cultivate a further picture. Equitable arts facilities are also in need across our district. Thankfully, SPLOS funding will provide an opportunity to improve some of our high school theater spaces to meet APS standards for theater lighting, sound, and AV equipment. However, needs at the elementary and middle school still persist. We will continue to work with school and district leadership to promote a rigorous progression of arts courses in each cluster. Through recruitment and retention of students and vertical collaboration, 
Students who begin the study of dance in elementary school will have access to continue their skills of, and understanding of dance in middle school and develop their artistic voice of expression through movement in high school. This concludes the update and I'll now take any questions. <laughs> this is good. Maybe I'll take someone's question. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, that you're welcome. Excellent presentation. I have two artists. I love art. It's critically important to have the arts in all our schools. Um, so thank you for highlighting all the great work you're doing. And I know you all are very aware of the gaps we have. Um, and Carver is a school in my Board of Education district. So I want to go to slide, I believe it's eight. Um, and for starters, band. I mean, we have a school that went to the state for football, and they did not have a band. Yes. And we know you all are well, well aware of that, and I love seeing all these partnerships, especially Atlanta Music Project. So just wanted to know what we're looking at doing to help close those gaps and share resources. Yeah, so band at Carver Early College was a staffing issue this year, and I've already spoken with the principal, and it is in her plan to make sure that they will have that opportunity next year. Thank you so much You're for welcome. that. And real quickly to um, your partnerships, do you all manage that process kind of, I'm gonna say in-house for you all, because you know best the, the fit for our schools? Mm -hmm. Yes. In co coordination with our Office of Partnerships, or how does that work? Yes, sometimes if we need help, then we'll reach out to them, or sometimes an, um, an organization might come to partnerships, and then they'll push it our way if it's something that's applicable to our arts um, programs. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Yeah. Appreciate it. Sorry, I think you were first, Cynthia. Hi, hey. I'm Jennifer. We've never met, but I follow you on Twitter. And I follow you I, on Twitter. <laughs> this is not how I would normally start any conversation ever. But I, I, I think it's so important to tell you that you infuse a lot of joy into that platform. Oh, great. That platform needs a lot of joy. Oh. It is very yes. short on joy. I've learned so much about what we do district-wide because of you. Oh, thank and you. It just, I was so delighted that you were gonna come and talk tonight because it's incredibly important, these programs, but I think it's, you're such a good conduit to share what is going on, so I just wanted to say thank you for that. Oh, thank you. Hey, it's hey. me. So um, my question, I will use slide 16 as an example, but it, it could apply to, to, um, to other clusters. So my question is here, specifically where I see blanks, is it a matter of lack of interest or is it a matter of lack of resources? So specifically on side 16, I see that TAG is the only elementary school in the cluster that does not have a band program. Is that because the students there aren't interested or is it because of resources? I think sometimes it's a combination of both. Um, maybe there's not enough interest, and so they think that that program can be, you know, faded out. Um, so I know at TAG this year they only have an hourly music teacher, which I think was a funding issue. Um, so that's something that we just continue to advocate with principals with to try to find creative solutions for how to get those positions funded. Whether it's sharing with another school, so maybe there's not enough enrollment at a school to have a full-time music or art teacher, so we might try to partner with another school so that they can have access to those services. Um, and if there's a situation where with funding they're still not, is still not available, then we find other ways through part to at least try to give those opportunities to students. So whether it's, you know, through additional opportunities through the partnership that we have at the Woodruff or things like that, just so that they have exposure to arts, even if they aren't having standard-based instruction. So what suggestion do you have for parents in any of these spaces where there may be a blank? How do they elevate or escalate their, their desire to have a program in their school? And is that something that they do? How, what does that look like? Yeah, I mean, I think definitely advocate to your principal um, that you have a need, that your student wants to have these classes. And then just loop me in too. And even if it's something, again, like I said, that we can't fund a full-time position, that we can offer some kind of support, even if it's just me connecting them with the Atlanta Music Project so that they can get support outside of the school day. Okay, and my last question, 
I, I believe it's touched on in the audit. Mm -hmm. And the question is around how do arts live in our, um, at uh, Henry, Hank, Aaron, New Beginnings? Like, how does yes. the art program how are we using our arts in that space? Yeah, I mean, definitely in all of our alternative programs, schools, that's definitely an area that we want to focus on, just like we touched on adaptive art and music therapy a little bit, expanding that program. So again, that's just us advocating that that's a need for those students and me having conversations with those leaders about what it is that we can do to support whatever's going on at, at their program or school. So is, is it there now, or are we advocating to have it We are advocating now? to have it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah. It's a great presentation. I just wanted to give a shout out to the arts department and the arts teachers who really got creative to ensure that arts instruction um, continued when we were virtual. I mean, that was a heavy lift, and I just wanted to say kudos you know that was hard they are um, amazing um, also I really greatly appreciate the connection of arts with the dimensions of learning when you're talking about um, um, arts integration um, aligning with other competencies um, this is something you know I talk about a lot but you know trying to use everything we can to further literacy and art is a you know I'd be a, I'm really excited to see how we can fold that into you know boosting our literacy um, and also my last question is um, are we that we have these great partners um, with the arts programs are we um, partnering with our facilities like do, are, are we offering use of our facilities and are renting them out to say theater groups and things like that I don't know if you want to take that question I'll, I'll say it again. Um, are we, like, now that we've got these great arts programs that we're working with in the community, mm -hmm. are we, um, like, opening up our facilities, renting them out to, say, theater groups and things like that when we're not using them? Or um, hmm. <laughs> I'll have to go back and, um, and, and, and look specifically at our system, but, but that, would be, that would be something that we would want to originate out of the school, and if the school, the schoolhouse is actually um, willing to partner and have that sort of availability, then from an operation standpoint, we would, we would help facilitate that. Um, I'm not aware yeah. of any rentals, but, but that doesn't mean it's not happening, and I can go back and, and, and look into our system and see if some of that has happened in the past. And then thanks for that, Mr. Hoskins. I was just going to say, Board Member Jones, and so that might also be an opportunity for us to check and see if there's something uniquely designed in that capacity. We can find that out and follow back. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for this. I appreciate it. I uh, want to talk a minute about standards of service. And probably slide 17 is going to be the best place to go back to. Um, and my question involves how much flexibility and autonomy individual schools have to, desi to decide how much or whether they're going to offer a particular arts program and how that fits into our standards of service. And like, for instance, on slide 17, as has already been pointed out, uh, Carver Early College only offers visual art. Uh, Jackson and Midtown, on the same slide, offer eight different, have eight different arts offerings each. Um, and so I'm concerned not only about equity horizontally across the same types of schools, but also vertically. Uh, I think both IB and STEAM require a certain number of arts experiences for each child in a given year. So how do we, how, how do schools decide what they're going to offer? You've addressed that a little bit up to this point, but what, what are our minimums and how do we 
uh, either encourage or enforce those minimums? Um, so the minimum in elementary school is music and art, each for 40 minutes once a week. Um, at the middle school and the high school level, the minimum should be visual art, band, and choir are offered. Um, I think sometimes it's a numbers and a, um, and a budget issue, right? I mean, Carver has 300 and... Yes, yeah. they're small. Yeah. So just to add to that, it really is a budget and a staffing issue when it comes to schools. Um, we do work collaborative, collaboratively with our associate superintendents to ensure that the offerings are equitable, but sometimes it does just come down to budgets and what schools can offer based on their school size and their staffing. So, and I know you also indicated that in the future we were going to work harder on that vertical alignment so that a student uh, who, who has taken dance all the way through elementary school, mm -hmm. doesn't see it drop off mm -hmm. in middle school only to pick up again in high right. school. Uh, what do you need in your department by way of support to increase both the, the horizontal alignment mm -hmm. so that a student at Carver is going to have as much of an art rich experience as a student at Jackson uh, and also to make sure that vertical alignment happens? <laughs> um, I think just um, continued support. Y'all have been great. We've had performances almost every board meeting um, once we were back face to face last year. Um, so just continued support from leadership and making sure that principals and decision makers are understanding the importance of the arts. Um, and. Um, the arts are included in all of our district-wide, you know, um, events, whether it's state of the district or um, our board um, installation with y'all. So I think just an um, just a continued importance um, and voice to the principals that that it is a vital part of each student's experience. Do you have not? not asking you to name names, but do you have problems with principals understanding the importance of arts in our schools? I think they just have tough decisions, right? Mm -hmm. They have so much, yeah. Okay. That's a very yeah. fair, that's yeah. a very <laughs> fair response. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, yeah. just checking in on yeah. that. Yeah. But I, I know they have to make tough yeah. decisions, but and, and wanted to make sure that we weren't disrespecting principals that's right. no, that's making right. tough I'm decisions sorry, I'm, by. No, I was, <laughs> okay, no, good, okay, not. good. <laughs> no. Okay, just checking. Yeah, um, I, I mean, as I mentioned, the, you know, conversations when you were asking about Carver, we've had, you know, I'm open and the principal's back open with me about it. Young middle school, they don't have a choir program, so we're starting that next year. So there's conversations and principals are willing. Sometimes they just you know, they just have a lot on their plate. So it's hard to even recognize um, where the gaps are. And the audit is one way that we're making sure that they understand where they are in terms of offerings across the district. And thank you for the audit. It was just oh, incredibly yeah. helpful. Thank you. So. Great job. Thank you. Um, You've clearly been paying attention to questions that have been asked of you over the last few years. Yeah. And um, as a result, this is one of the most, and I don't, I don't say this lightly, it's one of the most informative presentations that I've encountered oh, thank since you. I've been on the board. So um, I appreciate you for that. <laughs> And you also do a great job just generally. Oh, um, so I just <laughs> make sure I shout you out with that too. So thank you so much, Dr. Womack, for that. Um, the slides, and you put them in here, like, like amazing, the, um, where you can make comparisons between clusters and you chart it out different ways. Um, it, it was enlightening for a number of reasons. And I, I appreciate you including it. You know, note we'd love to see more of that particularly when we talk about equity um but there there are many things that i see in these slides that run counter to what i would have thought based on preconceived notions feedback i received from community members stuff like that 
Um, so it's good to have this information out for the public, transparent, um, and in that space. So um, I wanted to piggyback off of Tamara's question because I think that, and Tamara, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the response was specifically related to school partnerships, but I thought your question was broader than that. Um, so, Larry, if you want to come back up. <laughs> um, because I think that, so you did answer the question about providing organizations, particularly those arts organizations that may be providing services to specific schools, partnering with with those uh, schools to have a space. But we also have empty properties that are in good shape that may need, uh, or not need, may be good places to house organizations, like arts organizations, um, to do their work. And what we find in Dr. Romack, you know more about this, is that arts organizations aren't broadly <coughs> supported generally. And because of that, whatever the community can do to support, or governments can do to support those organizations, the better, because then they can direct more money to the arts. Um, so I think the Tamara's question is, you know, how can we, whether it's through facilities master planning, uh, the outcome of that, whether it's proactively looking through initiatives, support organizations, specifically the arts organizations, by having them housed in one or two locations throughout the district where we have lots of space that is either not utilized or underutilized. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, sir, I was waiting on, is that a question? Or is, I mean. I, I thought it was. I, I agree. <laughs> I, I, think I thought we'll, I put how in there. <laughs> you did. Okay. okay. <laughs> it was a long question, but I did put how in there. May I? Yeah. May I? Want, so, yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I, I mean, you understand I, the question. <laughs> I understood the question. I think the challenge, in all fairness to Mr. Hoskins, was having an immediate response. And so it's a question for us to take and to shape uh, responses to it's to put mm -hmm. at the forefront of our thoughts as we're going into the summer, as we're meeting with partners. Our partner meeting is at the end of this month. This was a March 20, um, March 20, Third, y'all think I can see those three fingers, but I can see them. March twenty third. <laughs> uh, but to, to your question, um, um, Board Member Estevez, it's the, that that's what we need to take with us and figure out how to shape opportunity. To that point, Mr. Hoskins, you may not have an immediate answer, but we can have the opportunity to be responsive to it. Fair, fair enough in that regard. Yes. Thank you. Yes, that's yes, fair. Mm -hmm. And and you know, note that and Larry would have the the presentations and Pierre I did too, but Michelle helped spearhead concepts and ideas that we got from Georgia Tech that, um, that pr proposed that we utilize some of our empty school buildings as those community spaces. Yes. Um, where, you know, it could be very low to no cost to the school system other than leasing. Mm -hmm these properties to organizations so that you could have multiple organizations housed in one place and they could split across several organizations, many organizations, the costs to keep everyone's cost down and it'd be a benefit for the community. You have the building full or occupied and then you have these organizations essentially receiving uh, a subsidized um, space. Uh, so you could take a look at Larry knows it, but I'm but Dr. Herring. Look at you. Right, you can fair. take yes. a look at, at those presentations because the concepts from those students were enlightening, and it relates to what Tamara brought up. Thank you, thank you. Well, I, I was, I'm so glad we had this discussion, and I kept my mouth shut until now. <laughs> um, they, um, I, I totally agree with uh, what Jason has said, and, and really hope that we can do be very thoughtful towards the community with what we do with our, our facilities that are not in use. But I'd like to go back to Dr. Womack uh, in her presentation. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Hoskins, for listening to the feedback. Um, uh, 
big fan of the arts, you know, former ballerina, cellist, I, you know, I, I, I'm not a good drawer, nor am I a good singer, but I do have other talents. Um, but thank you so much. I, it, it is just so refreshing, and I think since you've been with us uh, over the past few years, everyone feels the energy that you bring to this work, and I really appreciate it. I'm very excited that you've gotten this audit. I think it's it's just so telling, and you, you use the word, vertical alignment is really important in the cluster experience, um, and that'll really help promote equity uh, for, for children in their mm -hmm. clusters. My specific question is, and I think if I understood everything pretty much correctly, and this was what I thought prior, mm -hmm. was basically the, the schoolhouse budget really drives what uh, what the educational experience is for children and, and principals and administrations and go teams are making sacrifices in other uh, with respect to arts to to ensure that other areas are, are fully um, are, are, are obviously for whatever reason more of a priority mm -hmm. and I think that that's something that we really need to revisit mm -hmm. as we talk about uh, allocating funds to schools mm -hmm. um, because of the disparities that we have and, and, and I'm not going to guess but and I'd have to go look at compare it to facilities but it, it, it looks like it's the smaller schools or some of the smaller mm -hmm. schools that are really taking the harder hits. Mm -hmm. Um, my question is, with respect to your department and your budget, the finances that you and your team mm -hmm. receive, are those the allocated dollars that go into the supplies? And, yeah. and I know it's not in here, and this was great, yeah. and I'm not trying to be fussy, no. but it would be great to know what that is at an elementary sure. school level, a middle school level, and an upper school level, because I was recently told it, it's six dollars per mm -hmm. child in an elementary I, for all, six, all students. It's six dollars for mm -hmm. all students. Right. Okay, so it's yeah. six dollars for all students. I I just be honest with you that for the whole school year. Yes. Yeah, I I think we need to sit down and revisit that. I think that's also creating a lot of the disparities that we may or may not be able to see in mm -hmm. the audit, and I've not read it in great detail. But I mean, I know. As a parent, what I'm asked, mm -hmm. and I know that there are many parents out there that are unable to participate at that level. Right. And so we need to do better within our organization to make sure that, and again, I'm not saying it could be sixty dollars, but right. you know, gradually try to figure right. out like how can we make sure that students have more, um, so that if they're lacking in, like, like if it is just arts and general music in their school, mm -hmm. that they're getting the bang out of their buck right uh, and I think six dollars is just quite yeah. not enough yeah. so that's just my take and whatever we can do to to take a deeper dive into that because this sure. is to your point um, and I just read something recently and I I don't remember who it was or where it was or whatever because I read a lot um, but uh, it basically said your child would do better with arts mm -hmm. than coding yeah like having having arts in their education and participating in coding will actually make them much mm -hmm. stronger critical thinkers and i was just like gosh that's so poignant because we're in such a different world now where everyone's like oh you got to learn how to code so you can have a job in the future well maybe but i i, I like what this person said yeah. uh, with respects to really understanding how the critical thinking is developed and using both sides of the brain and arts is obviously a huge part of that. So right. I just wanted to share that with you sure. um, to see what else we can do to advocate and see maybe what we can do to help your department have a little extra money so that you can you can help the children out. Yeah, yeah, and I'll you know share a deeper dive you know through typed <laughs> response, but it is six dollars per pupil at every grade level. So if a school has three hundred kids, they get six times that amount and then typically that's split with all the arts teachers so if it's an elementary school half of that goes to the art teacher half of that goes to the music teacher um, if it's a school that has like art band and general music art gets half they just have so many more consumables once you use paper and paint you can't reuse them again Correct. so they get half of those supplies and then all the performing arts get the other half um, and then, but then within our budget too, we are able to still do transportation for all of our football games and our large group performance evaluation assessments, all of our professional learning, new instruments, new art equipment. Um, so, and then we still have, you know, our whole partnership side where we're asking artists and arts organizations to come into the school. So I can give you a deeper dive into what actually we're spending our money on and where maybe some support um, could be lifted. Well, I would appreciate that as yes. budget chairs. <laughs> 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 and, 
and I'm sure Ms. Bracken wouldn't mind getting more detailed information. Yeah. She may already have it, but um, yeah, I guess I think it's, I certainly think it's worth exploring for all the reasons that we've heard from my colleagues. Yeah. Sorry, really quickly, and could not agree more okay. with Board Member Olympiadis for the long term. Um, but in the short term, for a unique situation like Carver with a smaller school, what is the best way for parents, caregivers to get information about exposing their children, having um, oh. music classes, uh, maybe theater with some of our partners we're working with right now? Like I have a community coffee this weekend. I would love to share that information there. Yes, good afternoon. Just wanted to provide some clarity in reference to the Carver Arts issue. Um, similar to Best in CSK, there's a shared experience because we have the Carver campus. You have the Carver Partner School in terms of STEAM and the Carver Early College in terms of the traditional route. There's one football team, but all of the students from both campuses attend. In terms of Carver Early College, if a student requests another arts class, that's a shared experience with Carver STEAM. Similarly, if there's an AP class at Carver Early College and a STEAM student wants to take that class, it happens at the Carver Early College campus. We've been in that space since about seven, 2017, 2018, and it continues to grow and build as one school offers something different from the other school, and they have the benefit of proximity to make sure that students have more options. So I know that visual shows you just visual arts, but that's not the only thing that a student can take on his or her schedule because of having two campuses and the shared agreement. Just want to provide that clarity. And I appreciate that a lot. I'm all about sure. that shared Absolutely. <laughs> um, resource and experience um, and just making sure in the interim where we have some small gaps or I would say larger gaps, but I, I appreciate what you're saying 100% sure. um, that we're connecting people with additional partnerships we're already working with. But I, I greatly appreciate that explanation. And I know a lot of people are working collaboratively to make sure children have access to the arts. Um, and we're gonna get that band. I'm yes. excited. All about the support. I just wanna make sure I'm connecting people with resources that we have access to. So is it emailing you? Is it, how, how's the best way? Yeah, if you just parents? email me, I'll at least know who to put in contact with who if I, if I don't know, so yeah. All so very much, I really appreciate it. Couple of questions before we close out. Just talking about Carver, um, Dr. Sims, I don't know, what other course offerings, what other offerings are there that align with the shared experience? And the reason why I ask is because that, that narrative isn't out there, and so, yeah, besides art, what, what are the other course uh, art offerings that are there? I'm just going from my past time overseeing that space. I, knew, I know they share dance, I believe they share course. We'd have to get back with you in reference to those specific offerings. I don't want to misquote any of those offerings. Okay. If you can get that, that'll be great, just so that we can be, can, so that we can, in, in fact, share that information with the community, and then that'll give them a good segue to, uh, to connect with Dr. Womack on just, you know, um, involvement or what we need to do to increase it. Sure thing. Yeah, thank you so much. And then if I may, uh, Chairwoman uh, Collins, if uh, Dr. Sims gets that, I'll get it to you and the full board as well, the, that shared experience. And similarly, in the exchange, I'll, get, we'll, we'll, I'll be glad to serve in that capacity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I just had one, one thing that we didn't really tap on. I know as we are looking at what's offering and trying to offer balance um, throughout the district, how is teacher shortages a part of this um, because often we hear about what's not being offered and that's just it versus all of the factors like funding um, which is a second part of my question and other things that are happening so how is teacher shortages impacted by what we're seeing what we're seeing in arts yeah I mean Carver really was the only staffing issue um, we are having shortages of arts teachers and are having just to be creative maybe they don't have an education degree I um, mean, we're, you know, they're doing different pathways for certification. Um, and so it is impacting, you know, what we're able to offer, but we're finding new ways and are being creative about having how to navigate that challenge. Is it something that we need, that's compelling enough that we need to be cons like really concerned about, or this is just the, the, the ebbs and flows of teacher hiring? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it has to do with the pandemic and just how teachers are feeling in general. Um, so I don't think it's specific to the arts. I think it's a more generalized issue. 
And going by the the example that you use with, um, and I mean, we're not targeting Carver, but just going by the example where you're saying where there's a student body of about 370 students, and because of that, funding will only be allocated for a certain level of arts funding. How does that overlap with our student-based funding and more of the equitable stance where we want to offer more diverse offerings to schools that are typically in our low, typically in our more struggling areas where these charts are actually showing less in those schools, and so just wanting to see what you know, what does that look like in regards to funding wise? Is there an advocacy space that we should be in as a board and in budget to kind of really try to level out the playing field in that space? Yeah, and maybe Ms. Bracken can speak more, but they, um, I don't want to over speak, but I think they just get a pot of money. It's not like it's mm -hmm. earmarked for arts teachers. So, and then the principal has a discretion to choose how they use those funds. Absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so it is funded through the student success funding formula. Any art allocation comes through that per pupil allotment. And just like we talked about earlier, uh, while our schools that are um, facing additional need or even our small schools that receive small school supplements, they are still taking that same pot of funding and putting that around wraparound services, direct instruction, school administration, arts. So it's that, that trade-off conversation that we all have during the budgeting process. Okay. But there aren't, there aren't art-specific earmarks through the funding formula. Okay. I just just making a connection because I think what I, I think what is important to say here is in the case where it um, it comes that the school isn't offering anything mm -hmm. and they go to the and there's a conversation at the school leader you know at the school level about well why isn't uh, you know more offerings of art at my child's school and then mm -hmm. there's conversation of funding well there's not enough funding well let's talk about what the allocations are like. And so I, th I think I'm just kind of setting the stage for deeper questions to be asked. And I think that's where Katie and I and some of us, that, you know, and board members can really have community members and, and parents to really start thinking and getting involved with in regards to the school budgets to understand. Um, so I just wanted to kind of make, just wanted to some more information on that to make sure that we were still in that same path in regards to at least putting the money there, but still giving schools the autonomy to decide. Sure, this actually came up in our last budget commission meeting, um, really focusing on the, the conversation at that time was the percentage allocation towards direct school administration, but the same principle can be applied in that we can look and see how schools are allocating like percentages of their budgets towards specific programs and that should show us outliers, right? So if we do see a school, if there's a range of art allocations in most schools between X and Y, we should be able to see schools that are kind of falling outside of that. And that helps prompt the conversation of then where are those dollars going instead? And that at least it offers an opportunity for those principals to make the case of why for this year or for the next couple of years, that might not be the uh, the strategy or the yeah. opportunity yeah. that they're leaning into the most, knowing that eventually that is something they would want to realign their resources back mm -hmm. to. But we can at least do the data pull. Great point. I appreciate that. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for that. And just my last question, very quick. Any any update on the city resuming the CEP plans or the culture? The um, yeah. So we're project? we're underway. We started in January. So um, let me. I can tell you exactly what trips we have for this oh, year. So oh, it's truncated. Okay. Just yep. because again we just started that. in January, yeah. and then some of our venues have capacity issues, so they were only allow. Four, you know, 40 students at a time. Well, when we're trying to serve all of fourth grade, 40 students at a time, it just wasn't possible. So for this year, um, our kindergartners are going to the Botanical Gardens. Our first graders are going to the Chattahoochee Nature Preserve. Um, our second graders went to the Atlanta Ballet. Um, they went to see Snow White at the Cobb Energy Center. Third grade is going to the Georgia Aquarium. And then our, our high schools have options. So, because you know everybody's taking different pathways in high school. So they can choose between Oakland Cemetery, the High Museum, the Atlanta Opera, Shakespeare Company, the Chick-fil-A Backstage Tour, Zoo Atlanta, the Apex Museum, Theatrical Outfit, and the Alliance Theater. 
in our fourth through eighth grade, eighth that grade is anything for them? No. no. Okay. So that was some of the venue capacity okay. issues. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. But next year, yep. full slate, ready to go. Got it. Great. Thank you so much. I yeah. really appreciate it. As you thank can see you. from our questions, very informative. And thank you so much yeah. for this information and dialogue. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Dr. Heron. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, team. Great job. Our next item, family engagement. Mr. Al Pacino Hogue, our senior strategic, strategic advisor to the superintendent and our Harvard fellow will be presenting. Um, Mr. Hogue, we are ready for your presentation on family engagement. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Madam Chair, Madam Co-Chair, Superintendent, <clears throat> members of the board, APS families and APS community at large. I uh, rise to present the annual updates about family engagement here in APS. I want to start off with just a note of gratitude. I really appreciate um, the, the warm welcome that I've received here in uh, APS. Uh, you all have been kind to a guy who was born and raised in the north, so I appreciate it. Uh, my remarks today will flow uh, in the following way. I'm going to provide a, uh, an update on the current workings of the Office of Family Engagement. We'll talk about some of the impacts of those works, uh, as well as share some opportunities and next steps. And I'll also share some recommendations for system improvements as we move forward. This is just a landing slide just to sort of align on um, the mission, vision, and values of the Office of Family Engagement. Um, I'll share that every um, school district and organization defines family engagement in a different way, a uh, slightly different way. And here at APS, our definition is centering around genuine relationships and really supporting families so that they can support their students both at school and at home. And as I'm going through the presentation, I'm actually going to refer to the Office of Family Engagement as OFE, just to so I don't say the word so many times. Uh, family engagement in action. Over the next several slides, I'll talk about some of the work uh, that is uh, happening here in the district. Um, one of the things that we are, um, well, one thing that started recently is a family engagement leadership teams, and these felts, as we refer to them, were started in uh, 2019. And these are school-based teams made up of building leaders, uh, those who provide wraparound services, parent liaisons, uh, members of school governance, so GO teams or PTAs. And essentially, this group is tasked with being the collaborative force that actually strategizes around family engagement and sort of thinks together and thinks creatively of how to overcome any challenges that get in the way at the school level around family engagement practices. Um, at the beginning of the year, the OFE asked uh, schools to identify members of the felt team and uh, 65 schools have identified members of uh, felt teams. A couple of years ago, the Office of uh, Family Engagement actually uh, piloted a family engagement survey dashboard. And this dashboard was birthed out of a fellowship that members of the OFE participated in with the Flamboyant Foundation. The pilot, which was in partnership with the Data Information Group, ran for two years uh, with eight schools in the Mays and Jackson cluster. Um, the survey itself really gave schools some insights on, on what's happening with families, how do families feel about their relationships with the school, but did so in a way that was really actionable. So the survey data was available to the schools that year, and so they were able to make some strategic change, uh, changes as it related to family engagement at the schools. Now our Parent as Partners Academic Center, which is affectionately known as PAPIC, uh, shares the Hollis Innovation Academy building. PAPIC really serves as a resource to the APS community at large. The district's parent mentor in the Department of Special Education also has an office in, in PAPIC. The center directly connects families to community supports, um, such as the upcoming Summer Camp Expo on March 25th, uh, and also provides parent liaison and school-based and school based, um, professionals with uh, the resources that they need to ensure that they can carry out their parent uh, and family engagement efforts. 
There's more information about the Summer Expo on our Family Engagement website, but you can see here that it's going to be on March 25th. And again, this is an annual occurrence. It will be virtual, and this really gives family an opportunity to get registered for the summer experiences across Atlanta. Our Office of Family Engagement leads monthly learning sessions with parent liaisons uh, and family engagement support staff. In the past, I've presented at some of these uh, gatherings as well as offices across the district, including federal programs, the GO teams, the Data Information Group, and our Partnerships Office. Uh, this space is really also used to introduce parent liaisons and family engagement support staff uh, to community organizations and really bridge uh, relationships in that way. And so each month, we'll also bring in representatives that provide either parent uh, capacity building services or provide some uh, support services for our scholars. Um, we do not have parent liaisons in all schools. I mean, the previous conversation about the tough uh, choices that principals have to make, that is a reality as it relates to our parent liaisons as well. There are approximately 33 parent liaisons by title in our schools, and of that number, about half are part-time. This was mentioned in a previous board mem uh, meeting, so I won't spend much time here, but back in November, we did have a uh, uh, staff appreciation brunch for our parent liaisons and folks who support our families in the school. I would just say here, very touching moment uh, of the partners across uh, Atlanta, given their gratitude and, and thanks for working with our PLs. And uh, I would say that there's an opportunity here to make this a uh, annual occurrence. And we also offer opportunities for our parents to develop um, additional capacities to support academics both at home and in school. Uh, we have partnerships with United Way and HTI Catalyst that actually help the OFE connect families to these opportunities. Uh, we've seen some cases where families or parents that have participated in these learning sessions have actually gone on to become APS staff people. So building those capacities to uh, do that work is going to be an important uh, addition and next step. We also talked about the uh, Family Engagement Conference, which took place in November. And again, there were about 300 attendees uh, there. And we know our families are asking for more of these type of experiences so that they can know what's going on in the district, of course, but also be better equipped to um, be in partnership uh, with their students and their academic development. One of the newest pieces of uh, strategies that's on the ground is the Mail Engagement Network. Uh, this Mail Engagement Network was designed to be uh, a community space, especially for our fathers in the district, uh, fathers and other males who support uh, students. And it really is an opportunity to engage in dialogue and celebrate uh, what's happening in our schools and in our community. The directory that you see there is a centralized source of organizations uh, and contact information for our schools as they look to support fathers and male figures in their student lives. At a previous um, expanded cabinet uh, meeting, I shared that when I was growing up, I sort of watched how my father was treated by the school versus how my mother was treated by the school, and there was truly a difference. And so um, we sometimes have heard that our fathers don't know necessarily where to fit into the schools. So these type of community spaces that are for men, uh, we think can be very beneficial to seeing uh, more men feel comfortable and welcome in our buildings. Uh, the Office of Family Engagement is also really involved with our alumni. Uh, right now there are about 500 APS employees that are alumni of the district. And along with the alumni and community engagement efforts, that's really in collaboration with the Partnerships Office. Um, there were many activities over the year um, uh, between the alumni and these community engagement uh, efforts, including 500 books being donated in the district, a lunch and read at one of our elementary schools, as well as uh, support in open houses and food drives throughout the district. So as you can see, there's a lot of moving pieces um, with our Office of Family Engagement. And with all those efforts in action, we know that the district still faces some challenges as we endeavor to be in full partnership with our families. And I want to name that there are a multiplicity of factors that contribute to some of the uh, roadblocks that we sometimes find ourselves in. Some of them rest with families. Some families uh, don't necessarily have the confidence to you know, support their students in this new math or this new homework or this new curriculum. Sometimes it's the students themselves who are, as they get older, are not interested in their families being present in their school. And sometimes it's the school. Sometimes it's the resources that are available. Sometimes it's the skill set or the time that 
uh, staff members have to connect with our families. So rarely is the challenge that we see um, simply down at the level of people not caring enough. And I want to make that clear because sometimes we think that if a person's not in the building that they don't value education or they don't care, and that's not always the case. It's much more complex than that. As we um, think about this work, I want to begin actually with this notion of power. And we know that the flow of power in the country that we reside in actually creates the reality where those who are directly affected by systemic inequalities often have little voice uh, and uh, offer few opportunities to influence the solutions to those problems. And I want to start here with power because baked into this top-down idea of power dynamics in our country, there are elements of respect, uh, authority, and assumptions of competence. So in other words, who is valued, who is invited in partnership and seen as knowledgeable and worthy, or who is invited to be a client to be served. At the core of family engagement work, it's really about flipping that power and starting with the community and starting with the folks that are closest uh, to the community and allowing that power, in this case, it would be expertise on their children, on their communities, and allowing that expertise to influence actually from the community on up to our schools and here to the central office. Now the consequences, because Atlanta Public Schools is not immune to traditional power dynamics, uh, the consequences of these power dynamics show up in inequities. And any of these bullets can be traced back to that notion of power and a question of who has power and who does not. And we know we have here uh, at the district over 700 family members and community members and staff that actually play uh, really big leadership roles in the advocacy and the governance of our school. And that should be that's a fact and that should be named uh, because that is a great thing. And we also know that we have families that still do not feel part of the district. They feel, still feel like they don't have a voice and a space uh, in our uh, district. So some of the challenges um, that serve as barriers to us partnering with our families to ensure stronger student outcomes and improve schools are, for example, um, the notion that came up earlier, school autonomy. And the autonomy itself is not an issue, but there are three uh, family engagement models that exist here in the district, um, the academic parent teacher teams, removing barriers, and school design. And in it, on the surface, those are great options to have, but the reality is good practice means that all three of those models will be available at all of our schools. Uh, another challenge is the reduction of family engagement to one-dimensional or one-off activities. Um, this idea that we can have an event or have a flyer or hold a meeting, uh, family engagement really is an ongoing, very dynamic and complex process. And sometimes, for a variety of reasons, uh, it can become a check the box uh, initiative and not as complex as it needs to be. So in order for us to do this work, um, we uh, to do this work better, I should say, because there's a lot of work happening, a lot of good things that are happening. Research tells us that there needs to be certain organizational and process conditions um, that all stakeholders see and they know uh, and they can act on. And so you can think of organizational conditions like the framework. It's the infrastructure of, that needs to be present in a school system. And you can think of, pro think of process conditions as really the nuts and bolts, the things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. So to get there, I offer um, the following recommendations. Um, first, as a step zero, is really for uh, everyone in APS uh, and in the Atlanta greater area to know and have a clear understanding of the role of the OFE um, and how much that office plays as a, plays a primary, really plays as the primary holder of this complex work. Uh, you know, shaping the narrative, building capacity, all those sort of things. And so the OFE leads this work, but it's really important that all of our stakeholders play a role in our uh, family engagement office uh, efforts. And that's really important because the team, the Office of Family Engagement, has two folks in it right now. Um, the word on the street is that might change soon, um, but uh, in, in the present time, there are two folks that are carrying uh, this work and leading this work forward. So I say that, and I'm going to make a, recommend, uh, a few recommendations. And what I'll do is I'll talk about a bullet under each recommendation. 
and this information, of course, is available for future consumption. But I'm going to recommend that we expand, that we fix, that we begin, and that we invest. In terms of expansion, I would uh, uh, encourage the district to expand the family engagement professional learning opportunities that are available to families and school staff, and to really make this an ongoing occurrence to make it robust in that folks get a chance to learn, get a chance to practice, get feedback, and then the cycle continues and not treat it as a one-off, once-a-year kind of process. Uh, in terms of fixing the parent liaison representation in the schools, again, not all of our schools have parent liaisons. Not all of our parent liaisons are full time. And so I would uh, definitely encourage the district to reclassify that position uh, to full time roles in every school uh, and ensure the schools have the resources to uh, have those positions in place. I would encourage us to begin tracking family engagement data, looking at the practices and the impacts on students and families and educators and schools. And lastly, I would encourage the district to invest in a broad district-wide family engagement review, audit, whatever we want to call it. But really, um, it is putting up a mirror and diving into the process conditions, those nuts and bolts, here at the district so that we can learn what improvements need to be made. That is the data that will drive the professional learning opportunities. That is the data that will substantiate future investments in parent liaisons and other positions in family engagement. So those would be my uh, true recommendations for you. I know that those take time and it, uh, it's not an overnight fix, but I do believe that under the right conditions, uh, all of our families and community members really can be our strongest and most natural allies. With that, I'll take questions. Well, I won't cut down on any of the questions because I don't have any questions. Um, <laughs> great job. I uh, appreciate the recommendations. And uh, it's interesting because we've gone, having been on the school board now, this is my ninth year, we've made movements. And then some of these recommendations were encountered to those moves that we've made in the past. Um, and not saying that the recommendations are, are not on point, but uh, it's certainly something that the administration should be taking um, these recommendations to heart and examining them uh, because truly the this department, this work is extremely important to the success of our students and the success of our schools. Um, in, in helping prepare our students. So uh, I appreciate all the work that you've put into this and the recommendations that you've highlighted for us here this afternoon. This is more of a uh, comment. Um, I just want to say um, thank you for um, giving us this presentation today. I know I had to step out, but I, can't, I looked over it before the um, work session. And it's very in-depth, and it highlight a lot of concerns that I've heard from my um, constituents in my district about parent, I mean, family engagement. Um, so I just want to say thank you for the presentation because you really highlighted um, those voices that feel like they haven't been heard, but also you came back with some solid uh, recommendations that I think would drive the work. Um, and the vision and the focus and one of our guardrails, um, goals and guardrails for the district and within that strategic plan of how we need to move forward with parent and family engagement. And I'm looking forward to, um, as you said, the word on the street, that vacancy to be filled because that also offers additional support for the work that needs to be done. So thank you for this presentation. So I'm going to echo, echo the thank yous. 
um, and really appreciate the actionable recommendations um, that, that follow from your insights. And so what I would be curious in finding out in terms of next steps is um, what are the cost implications of, of these recommendations and the reality of us being able to, to do these things and how quick, how fast, when, right? And even your um, feedback on, on those recommendations. So thank you very much, very, very, very much. Echoing my colleagues, thank you very much for this information. Um, you know, and I don't have the same historical background on the work that's been done already, um, but I have been a PTA president in a school that served a cross-section of students and families and worked really hard to meet families where they are. So I could not agree with you more about really reaching out to people and listening to them because sending your child to school is involvement, number one. Um, and so many families are invested involved in their schools. They just show it in a variety of different ways. So thank you for, of course, focusing on that. Um, and I see that the pilot schools were in the Mays and Jackson clusters. And I have Jackson cluster. I was just curious which schools you were working with in the Jackson cluster, if you have that information. I do. Uh, so, yes. So the eight schools were Beecher Hill, Cascade, Peyton Forest, West Manor, uh, Young, Bamo, Benteen, King, and Jackson. Right, because Bamo and Benteen are two schools that are small, mm. um, but they have key people who know their communities well and know their needs, and they really work hard to advocate for all families. So looking forward to this happening and how we really connect, because each school is different. That's right. Um, um, with the people who know and connecting them with the resources they think best fits their school and their students and families. So thank you for this work and I look forward to helping making it happen. Thank you. I realized um, it, it's a lot of information and I really appreciate it and it's great that you walked us through it and I just realized that if we're going to have parent liaisons that we think need to be elevated with respect to uh, better salary and you know more in, in more schools to really help communities. I'd like to advocate for special ed as well. I mean, Edith has been on mm -hmm. her own. Mm -hmm. uh, Rose, they were both part time when I first got started, and Rose left. But mm -hmm. I mean, Edith's been knocking it out of the ballpark all by herself, uh, and would really like to see um, special education uh, highly noted, um, especially when we're talking about families um, that yeah. really feel left out. Um, special ed and uh, in, in children with 504s um, really feel left out with respect to uh, educational equity in this in this district. So I'd just like to point that out um, and give Edith, of course, a shout out. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to suggest that we, and y'all are going to, Y'all gonna yell at me, I know, that maybe as part of a board retreat sometime that we schedule a, a time to, to talk about some of the, the historical antecedents of, of some of the recommendations and, uh, and all learn about where we've been and where we're going. Uh, I think that would be helpful as we move forward and particularly as we consider the the financial implications and the personnel implications, that that might be an important discussion to have. But thank you, I echo everything my colleagues have said about how wonderful the presentation is. Thank you. Just real quick, um, likewise, you know, I greatly appreciate um, the identifying areas of concern and the challenges and highlighting the need for us to differentiate the day-to-day -day, um, engagement to meet the community and families where and how it's most effective. Um, I greatly appreciate the sensitivity. I love the example of you know your father, you know, going mm. into school, um, and the nuance there around relationship building. Um, I like that PAPIC sounds a lot like a community schools model, um, which is really you know like trying to bring all resources together. Um, um, and I hope we can pursue that a little bit more. Um, my only concern. Um, is that without, and I guess that this is part of the development of the comprehensive, you know, communication and engagement plan, 
um, so this is all part of that, um, is the decoupling of the of engagement from the strategy and going back to um, what others said about the strategic plan, you know, just being really careful about making sure that we're consistent because what I would, and I appreciate having a GO team member, you know, on the felts. I think that's a great thing. I, I want us to, like, I would like to see more, like, interface, like inter interlacing of those bodies because um, the GO teams for a long time have already lacked a communication vehicle to reach community members to explain, you know, what their role is. Um, and I fear that we're, we're getting a little bit even farther away from the local school council concept where that was the vehicle for um, schools to communicate um, through the board and to um, the administration. Um, but everything else is, is phenomenal. You know, I just want us to make sure that we are not inviting uh, the potential for parallel, um, parallel communication tracks where we could run the risk of um, inviting mixed messaging or inconsistencies. So. so real quick, I want to thank you also for the work that you're doing with the engaging of the, the Douglas Cluster. Mm. Um, and want to highlight that, <laughs> and I want to highlight that this is a week that we're on for engagement, um, Wednesday. Wednesday. Right. So for those who want to be a part of the engagement of the Douglas Cluster, that that happens um, this Wednesday. There's a virtual session in the morning and then an in-person session that I believe will be at Stanton That's right. this week. Six o'clock. So thank you for that. Oh, for sure. Um, and, and bringing this to life in that space. I appreciate that. Thank you. Great. Yes, um, thank you so much. You know, thank you so much for this this presentation. I think, like other um, board members that have been been on the board before, um, definitely probably need a, Cynthia to your point. I need 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 of a retreat just to really double down on the strategy. Um, really appreciate you definitely pulling where we are now. Um, kind of disheartening to hear it as a nine year board member where we have revamped into fate you know we had our face mm -hmm. effort where you know our family community engagement department where we tried to actually compartmentalize it over the years to provide more space and autonomy for um, family engagement to develop into something robust and so it's good to see some of these programs that are in place I still had questions in regards to our impact of the programs um, and then it goes to when I see, see the slides so I'm going to give a big shout out to Keisha Copeland and Emily that has been riding and dying with us through this because they have been no yeah they they have and they've been um, um, riding with us over the years um, yeah Emily Holland um, in regards to PAPIC and just some of the work that they're doing, you know, the work that they've done. And um, I think the disheartening part about it is that we made a commitment to give them the resources that they need to grow their team so they can grow their effort and their impact. And so really would like for us to explore the opportunities of what that is like to double down on that, um, particularly now that it's in the Center for Equity and Social Justice. So I think I just kind of get, I'm kind of like flustered a little bit where we've brought on a lot of personnel and other departments, but one department that, that means the most for our, for our district in COVID, we have not um, been robust in that. So just wanted to express that. Also in regards to the parent liaisons, you stated that we, we have uh, 33 parent liaisons and of that about half of them are full time, right? So we're, I'm thinking if we're about 80 school sites, probably a little bit less, we're looking at about 40 plus something schools that don't have parent liaisons. Am I, am I quick to assume, am I, am I assume that correct? That would be right, quick math wise, yes. They, mm -hmm. they wouldn't necessarily have a parent liaison. It does not mean that they haven't designated a staff person to do some of the family engagement support work, yeah. but not a by title parent liaison. Okay, so just wanna really um, explore that um, as well. And I know some of this is probably something for the budget commission to think about, Michelle, or we're thinking about what does the investment and that uh, looks like, but really appreciate you telling, you know, really showing us where we are, yeah, where we are now, where we need to go, and making sure that history doesn't repeat itself and reverting back to a lot of the practices that haven't benefited us well as a district. So just wanting to um, thank you um, for that. So thank you. Mm -hmm. 
since you brought it back up to yeah, make it rain, I just get enough. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I, I just I, I want to say that I I do think we can be sensitive to to some schools that have felts that are actually functioning right now, where they where they have their team in place and they have robust uh, parent groups, uh, plus you know community foundations within the schools. I think I, I think. You've got your work cut out for you because the disparity is mm -hmm. so is so sparse, right? But I I, I think you're going to have to look at each each I, I like to say each school, but right. I'll you know each cluster at least at at a, at a high point, and then start to kind of dive in into what the specifics are in each of those clusters with respect to their schools, because there's definitely communities that need um, that need the equity need to be mm -hmm. need mm -hmm. to have all those extra steps and then there's there are other schools that are you know you're going to see in other communities you're going to see okay they're doing okay we've got mm -hmm. an opportunity here but it's not it's not this herculean uh task of trying to figure out how to how to work from the grassroots up and, and create something that other communities might have been able to do a, just differently. I just want to share that because, uh, you know, from a budget standpoint, yes, it's going to be very difficult to to onboard a full time person uh, in in every single school. However, if we looked at, at each community and then each school, we may see that there's opportunity. Will be based on the needs of those students. Since the class size ratio of one teacher to 15 students will remain the same as last year. We are anticipating a need of 750 middle and elementary school teachers. We have identified 21 elementary sites, 10 middle school sites, and 8 high school sites. Our registration window, which is open, opened on February 21st and will close on April 10th. Elementary and middle school students recommended for participation in ARA were identified using the winter map rich scores for students in kindergarten and first grade and the Georgia milestone achievement level predictor for students in grades two through eight. The number of students for each grade level is provided. Again, for elementary, that's 7,412. Approximately 20% of those elementary students are students with disability and or English learner students. In middle school, we are anticipating 3,811 students. And approximately 29% of those middle school students are students with disabilities and or English learner. Please note that our high school counselors will identify and register students for credit recovery by auditing their transcripts. The instructional framework will remain the same as last year. It is a blended approach where students will receive explicit instruction directly from their teacher, differentiated interactive instruction, and targeted instruction through small group learning. The elementary and middle school, again, will be a full day schedule. In the morning, our students will receive SEL, literacy, and mathematics. In the afternoon, our students will participate in Power Up. Please note that students who do not attend the full academic recovery portion of the day will have the opportunity to participate in Power Up. However, their families will need to provide transportation to and from the host site. Our host principals and summer administrators will determine the power of programming for their site. Consideration will be based on the APS5, specifically the cluster signature programming. Here are a few power up partners we have cultivated and curated, more will be added um, soon, very soon. The elementary schedule follows the traditional school day schedule. Our staff will arrive at 7.15 and our students will begin breakfast at 7.45, followed by social emotional learning, literacy, mathematics, and the Power Up program 
All are 90 minutes each. While the students are attending Power Up, our staff, our instructional staff, will be participating in professional learning. The middle school schedule is the same. It is similar to that of the traditional day schedule. Our staff will report at 845. Students will receive breakfast beginning at 915, followed by social emotional learning. Here you'll see that literacy, mathematics, and the Power Up program are all 90 minutes each. Once again, while students are participating in Power Up, our teachers will be receiving professional learning during that time. Our high school overview. Our high school students will attend summer ARA the same dates as our elementary and middle school students, June 1st through the 30th. If a student is enrolled in a course that has an end of course test, the exam dates are June 21st through the 24th. Our high schools will operate on a half school day schedule. Students may register for up to two courses. Once again, our academic focus for high school are credit recovery and graduation. They too will receive a blended model of instruction. That's direct instruction from their teacher and coursework through Edgenuity. Accommodations and teacher support for students with disabilities and English learners will be provided. Once again, social and emotional learning will be integrated and transportation will also be provided. The high school schedule is presented before you. Our staff will arrive at 815 and breakfast will be served at 845 followed by social and emotional learning. The students will then attend course one, have lunch, and attend course two. They will too will end their day with mindfulness and be dismissed by 1 p.m. Our staff, high school staff, will also engage in professional learning beginning at 1 p.m. Registration again has opened and it will close on April 10th. Breakfast and lunch will be provided to all of our students at no cost to families. Transportation, once again, will be provided for all full day ARA and high school students. If a student is only participating in Power Up, his or her families will need to provide transportation. Shown here are the elementary and middle school sites by clusters. Please note that students currently enrolled in AV AVA will participate in a virtual option for ARA. Sites were based on several factors. One, facility. Will there be summer projects held at a site? So their availability of the facility as well as the capacity. The number of students identified to attend ARA. The location of the site as well as whether or not that site was a site in the 2021 iteration of ARA. Here are our high school sites. And the same criteria for selecting site applies to high school. The summer job posting and hiring process are underway. We anticipate all positions to be hired by spring break. We will be only accepting internal applicants only. In collaboration with the APS Federal Programs Office, we are able to continue offering a pay increase incentive for needed summer staff. Our summer 2022 additional program office offerings, excuse me, are shown here. So again, we'll be offering Science and Math Summer Enrichment Academy, SIMC, um, Level Up, Fine Arts Camp, Xanatu, Kinder Camp, and so forth. Please note that Dr. Henderson Rosser and her team are exploring additional offerings, summer offerings, in the area of technology. We anticipate adding to this list in the coming weeks. 
mark your calendars. On March 25th, the Family Engagement Department will host a virtual summer camp and enrichment expo from 10 to 1 p.m. Once again, registration is open. And when will it close? April 10th. It's extremely important that all families register by April 10th so that transportation can create bus routes and those bus routes can be communicated prior to June 1st. Our summer APS website is being updated daily, so please check that out. And finally, as a last step for our office, in preparation for the upcoming school year 22-23, we will explore partner and provider program opportunities to support our families during the fall break in October and the winter break in February. Thank you for your time and attention. I will pause for questions. Thank you for the presentation. Um, just have two questions. <clears throat> One, I know I mentioned to you briefly, Dr. Heron, is um, summer job opportunities for our students um, that meet the age requirement, that get the, um, what is it, the work permit that is in line with the um, ARA, meaning they have their day in school and then the opportunity after school to engage with employment opportunities. Um, that's in line with our district. Um, and also in collaboration with the city, the county, or whoever, so they can have a full day, per se, more so that, as my parents would say, if you keep kids busy, they don't get into trouble. So that's where I'm trying to go. So I want to keep them busy <laughs> during the summer. Um, we experienced a lot of activity last summer and the summer before I understand the pandemic, we're in a different time. But now I just look at this as an opportunity to give them a full summer. Each summer, back when I was growing up, everyone had summer jobs. All the students that could work did. And I just want to see some of that come back. And I just wanted to know, is there any opportunity to entertain um, this scenario? So that's one question. The second question is, for the students that are not um, going to ARA and those that are, are um, how are we working with um, our city, our parks and recs, um, our Fulton County? because um, they do more of the arts and music from that side, and ensuring that we have some type of alignment, um, opportunities for the ones who are attending, and then also a, a good opportunity for the ones who are not attending, so that they still have access to some of these awesome programs that are supported by our city and county. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, one of the reasons why we, chose to have a half day program for high school is just for those reasons that you named. So that students will have an opportunity to work in the afternoon. So that they're not choosing to have a summer job or go to school and recover credit. We all want to uh, maintain or exceed that graduation rate of 83.1%, but we need our students to do that. And so we want them to choose both. That you have that opportunity to choose both. I can go to school in the morning, and recover that credit, but I also can work in the afternoon. So that is the main reason why we changed the program for high school. We are um, in communication, not only with our city, but with our Department of par um, Partnership and Development uh, around creating those partnerships and opportunities for those who may not be participating in ARA. Uh, we are hosting, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's March 23rd, a partnership summit of convening so that we can provide those opportunities um, to our students. Mm -hmm. 
you're pretty much touched on it because you're still going through that process and working. So I'm yes. eager to see the outcome okay. of those um, conversations. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I just had a quick question and wanted to know more about the DLI um, Power Up program. Sure. That is actually a new Power Up program, and it's under the guidance of Dr. Margaret McKenzie. And so that program, that Power Up program, will be for those DLI sites. Uh, students who are in DLI now will also have an opportunity to participate. And it's actually a science focus. Um, but they will be re attending that power up via Spanish. It's going to be taught in Spanish. That sounds awesome. Um, the so something like that, for example. I'm trying to find the slide. Oh, okay, here it is. So at a school where there's DLI. And then there's also other power up opportunities. Mm -hmm. Will the students get an option to choose between the yes, DLI they will. or the whatever the other off offerings are? Yes, they will. We're hoping to, um, they will have a, a, a schedule because they will be limited in the number of students they will be able to serve at one time. So perhaps they will have DLI, DLI science. Um, Tuesdays and Thursday this week, and Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, the other option. And then the following week, it may be Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and Tuesday and Thursday. And that's just a sample schedule. But yes, they will be able to participate in both. Great. And, and I just want to uh, appreciate the ARA. Uh, my son participated last year. He's going to participate this year. Mm -hmm. um, and I've heard, I heard just great feedback about the program okay. from participants. Um, and I think that it's something that uh, as it continues, mm -hmm. the school district is going to have an interesting, interesting decision come <laughs> <laughs> two more years, two more years, um, yeah. because it, there, there might be some, um, some reliance on parents mm -hmm. by parents because it, it's, it's, it's actually good. very helpful and he, he enjoyed it. Yeah. And and um, and learned a, a ton, um, so I can see other I can see parents, you know, coming to not see which was one of the goals of right. this program, Absolutely. not to see summer school is summer school, right? Uh, but to see it as an opportunity to recover and in, in some cases enrich, and we're definitely seeing that based on the feedback I've gotten. Thank you for that. Your feedback. May I respond to those? Uh -huh. yes. um, just a, a quick response uh, to um, Board Member Mitchell's question around summer opportunities. I do want to also um, name that we are in active communication with the city to partner with summer job offerings. Mm -hmm. We've been thoughtful ab about uh, trying to get something um, executed sooner than later, and those meetings are active and live. Uh, but both the, the mayor and I have, have committed to um, making certain that we can jointly offer more summer work opportunities uh, to our to our scholars and so please anticipate more in that regard as well and then um, board member Estevez I just want to appreciate uh, you sharing from a parent perspective how impactful the um, ARA has been uh, our uh, summer ARA work when we launched this um, last year is that that's right <laughs> things move so quickly um received a lot of attention and inquiry around not just the one year implementation of it but the fact that we committed to several years so i also want to simply remind our board that this intentionality as you so appropriately identified at the beginning has been tied to a strategic uh, effort to see um, vast academic improvement over time it will also be complementary to what we've invested in relative to our screeners because we recognize that we now have more formative data to help shape where the interventions are necessary and to be able to uh, capture that as we go from the school year to the summer uh, to the start of the next year. So at the same time, we want that experience to be joyful <laughs> and to be meaningful because it's the summer. Right? So I just want to acknowledge that but also name that to hear it from a, a parent voice 
happens to be here at the dais, but a parent voice from a student's voice is kudos to this team um, for us helping to get that established the way we had hoped for a student's experience. Thank you. I know we're running out of time. Uh, two, two quick questions. Uh, one, it, it says June 1st through the 30th, but it's four weeks. So say the first is like midweek. Could we get more specific so that families can plan around uh, yeah, wanting to participate, so that, you know. Yes, yeah, so it, it will be June 1st through the 30th. Okay. We, there will be a holiday because the district does observe, or will observe um, Juneteenth on June 20th. So that is the day that we will be closed. Uh, but you're absolutely right. It's the whole month of June. Okay, all right, because yeah. it said four weeks, and yeah. so I pulled it up and it split. All right, and then my second question is, um, and this is, this is an unusual question, but... <laughs> I see that we have ESY in some of the same sites that we're going to be able to offer after after mm -hmm. school enrichment. Is it potentially possible for uh, students to participate? Yes, absolutely. So, so, our, so our students who are participating in ESY will also be able to participate in Power Up. Okay, so yes. their parent, their families would just have to sign up for that. No, and they will. They will stay the entire day oh, unless the, the parents um, decide that they want them to come home. Okay, so then, sorry, I don't mean to follow up, but okay. I do. So, just will the if they're on a special ed bus, would the special ed bus pick them up at the end? Yes. Okay. All right. Just given their 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 nature. Okay, yes. that sounds that sounds great. I'm glad to hear that. Very equitable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ooh, I'm sorry. Like 10 seconds. Just echoing Board Member Mitchell and Dr. Herring's comments about partnering with the city for jobs for high schoolers, WorkSource. That's all I got to say. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Standing. Um, our next presentation and our last presentation will be, and thank you uh, both Ms. Parker and Dr. Levitt. Well done, Ms. Parker. Our next presentation will be our monthly financial update coming to us from our Chief Financial Officer, Ms. Lisa Bracken. And uh, Ms. Bracken, we are ready for our update. Thank you. Thank you. So good afternoon again, Board Chair Collins, members of the Board, Dr. Herring. Today I'll present four topics related to finance and then I'll once again hand off the presentation to Eric Long for an update on the legislative session. Can't see the slides. Okay, there we go. Uh, first I'll provide you with the financials for FY 2022 for all activities occurring in the months of July through January within the Consolidated General Fund. And I'll discuss the need for budget adjustments. And next I'll present an overview of the FY23 budget primer and provide an update on the 23 budget development process. With the next four slides, we'll cover the FY 2022 financials for the first seven months of the fiscal year. The financial position continues to be strong. So far, we've collected about 84.8% of the total resources budgeted with local collections at 97.53%, state at 44.01%, and other, which includes the Fund 150 Title I Transfer in at 38.93%. We are currently tracking ahead of pace for revenue collections overall as compared to this point in time last year. Last year by February, we had collected a total of 79.25% of total revenue, and this year we're already at 84.8%. We'll continue to monitor the pace of collections throughout the remainder of the year. On slide five, we see the budget to actual expenditures so far for FY22. We have current currently spent slightly more than half of budgeted allotments at 53.21%, and spending in all functions is appropriate for this point in the uh, fiscal year. Slide six represents the current spending trend for FY22 against the FY21 trend. By the end of January in 22, we had spent 52.06% of total annual spend, and this year we're at 53.21%. I want to highlight that changes in spending in certain functions, like transportation, can be explained by the operation model for the first half of the fiscal year last year as compared to this year. And what we are seeing is actually a return to spending that is more normal for the pace of this point in the year. I do want to take a moment to highlight a new initiative recently completed by our accounting team led by Tanisha Oliver and Eva Britt. In response to previous audits and to strengthen the overall safety and limit risk within our school-based activity accounts platform, we finalized enhancements to add positive pay and implement single sign-on for our end users. 
Positive Pay is an automated fraud detection tool offered by the cash management department of most banks. Checks continue to be the subject of more fraud than any other payment method. And using Positive Pay, our web-based fraud control service, we can make faster and more well-informed decisions about suspicious check activity. These features will protect schools from check fraud, provide additional information for the school-based finance managers, and enhance the usefulness and effectiveness of this tool. So kudos to that team. I'm bringing three budget adjustments for the Consolidated General Fund and one for special revenue. For the Consolidated General Fund, I'm requesting an increase to revenue and expenditures of 231464 for the Charter School Facility Grant, increases of 72201 for the Perkins Grant Carryover, and a decrease of $406,095 for Title I Carryover. Also, I'm requesting an increase to special revenue of $1,913,763 to revenue and expenditures for Title II carryover. Details for these adjustments can be found in Agenda Item 6.1. Agenda Item 9.4 includes the detailed information report for special revenue adjustments less than $1 million that have occurred in February. At this time, I'll provide an update on the FY23 budget development process and introduce you to the FY23 budget primer. A budget primer sets the stage and provides context to the public for the development assumptions and impacting factors of the budget process. This primer includes an overview of APS, including highlights for the year so far. It discusses innovations in resource allocation, including student success funding and the consolidation of funds pilot, and provides an overview of the budget process, including the budget development calendar and public engagement process. It grounds us in the FY 2022 current budget and provides an overview of the budget drivers, including the FY 23 guiding principles and budget parameters, strategic priorities, and known costs, including the annual 3% increase towards our share of the city pension and impacts of compensation models and TRS rates. It also highlights the national, state, and local economic trends. The budget primer can be found in agenda item 9.6 as well as on the APS budget website. The next three slides will provide an update on the FY23 budget development process so far and highlight our next steps. Slide 11 outlines the process we've undertaken to develop the most significant portion of our general fund budget, the school allotments. Schools received their FY23 allocations on January 11th. Principals presented their budget ideas to GO teams in late January and early February and continue to work on their final budget proposals through this past week when academic and staffing conferences were held and budgets were locked. The final step in this process will be final GO team approval throughout this month. There may be a need for a second opening of school budgets in April and May, should there be any substantial change to school enrollments, uh, programming, or revenue. If changes are needed to school allocations, that process will be tightly managed through our budget services department. Slide 12 walks through the central office department budget request process. Department heads again built their budgets this year using Aliview. They began this process January 11th and budgets were locked March 1st. There may have, oh, there have been many training and support sessions over the course of this month. And chiefs now have 10 days to review and approve their budget requests. And tentatively on March 29th and 30th, cabinet will retreat to discuss and prioritize these requests. And based on the conversations today, we have a lot to discuss. Um, after both the school and department budgets are developed, we can build the consolidated general fund budget request. We care, compare that to the proposed forecasted revenue and begin the inevitable gap closure conversations. We'll present to BFAC, um, our Budget and Finance Advisory Committee, the current state of the 23 budget on April 21st. And we will be continuing our compensation conversation and have a first look at the total general fund revenue and expenditure request for FY23 at the Budget Commission meeting on March 18th is when it's currently scheduled. That concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions you may have now, or I can wait until after Erica presents. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good, good afternoon, board members. Superintendent Dr. Herring. I won't be long. I know I'm standing between a lot of people and 
a well-deserved break. Um, there's been quite a bit of activity at the Capitol these past several weeks um, since our February board meeting. Um, in addition to the regular updates that you get, I just wanted to highlight um, a few of the more recent developments. You know, we can never celebrate anything um, legislative related until signy die and until the governor has signed the legislation. Um, but we have heard encouraging news with respect to Buckhead City, um, just, you know, news from legislative leaders on the House and Senate side that that bill is not going anywhere this year. Um, we have also heard some encouraging news on vouchers. Um, it's not quite dead yet, um, but we have heard from the leadership of, of the House side that one of the bigger voucher bills, which would have created a universal $6,000 voucher for any student enrolled in a public school, um, we have heard that that won't move this year. Um, with respect to Buckhead, there are some lingering bills that got committee hearings over the past couple of weeks. I think these were just as a courtesy to sort of give that community, um, that part of the community, a chance to have some issues heard. But all in all, it's looking pretty good on that issue. Um, some good news, some positive news with respect to SB 361, a bill that would provide for tax income breaks to individuals who make charitable contributions to police foundations, including police foundations connected to school district police forces. That bill unanimously passed the Senate. It was um, sponsored by, under the leadership of the Lieutenant Governor, and we expect, expect that that will do well and pass the House as well. Both the House and Senate have passed the amended FY22 budget. This is what's called the skinny budget. It, it provides, among other things, um, a $2,000 salary increase for certain educators in the state. Um, the Senate version of the bill um, bumped up from $1,000 to $2,000, the salary supplement for nurses, for school nurses, which is seen as a positive. Um, so that has to be reconciled between the House and Senate. There were some differences, but after that reconciliation process, it will go to the governor for signature. Um, and then there have been quite a bit of um, quite a bit of progress on bills that we see as a negative. Um, the Senate has passed a bill that would ban transgender youth from participating in school athletics. Um, there was a tremendous amount of discussion of this issue and through the committee process has happened the past several weeks and on the Senate floor. Um, but that bill has passed the Senate side. Um, the Senate passed the governor's mask mandate bill um, legislation that requires school districts in, to have a mask mandate that includes an opt-out for parents. Um, one troubling part of this bill is that the original sunset date was set for June of 2023. Um, the bill was amended on the Senate floor to move that back to June of 2027. Um, our, our lobbying consultants, our team, who are also at the Capitol, have had conversations just about whether there's any ways to change that sunset date. Um, just to explain that we obviously don't know what will happen um, on a health landscape over the next several years, and 2027 is an awful long time away. Um, so we're hearing that there are some legislators who understand this issue, so maybe there's a room for some movement on that. Um, the House passed legislation um, that was left over from last year, HB 517, that would increase the tax credit school voucher cap from $100 million to up to $200 million over the next several years. This is not a direct voucher, um, but it's a tax credit um, that basically allows taxpayers to put a certain amount of income tax paid um, towards a voucher funding mechanism. Um, so it's created this way in order to say that it does not directly come out of schools. Um, this bill was passed by the House on Thursday of last week. It did not appear on their legislative agenda in advance, but we have been told that this is the only voucher movement, real voucher movement that will happen this year. Um, the Senate passed just on Friday legislation that would prevent government agency employers from requiring that their workers have been vaccinated from COVID that passed the Senate. Um, there was extensive debate um, on the Senate floor, including from 
some of the senators who are doctors, who are health care professionals, but that bill did pass along party lines. Um, on Friday, the House passed um, the Parents' Bill of Rights legislation, as well as one of the divisive concepts bills. Um, there was substantial debate on both sides, a very robust debate, um, including reference from a couple of the Atlanta legislators to the resolution you all passed um, that addressed these divisive concepts. But those two bills passed by a party line vote as well. Um, so we continue plugging away. Tomorrow is Legislative Day 25 of 40. Crossover day is next Tuesday the 15th. That's the last day that a bill has to pass either the House or Senate in order to stay alive. Um, but your, your values, your political and legislative priorities are known by the Atlanta delegation, and we have seen quite a bit of success and engagement with them um, referencing the things that are important to you in the school district with respect to all of these issues. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Um, there, so I think it's important at some point, we don't have to talk about it now, but there, there are members of our delegation that are a member of our delegation that are voting for some of these, a couple of these bills um, and I mean I think it's important for our families to know that not saying again not saying right now yeah. but like some of these don't make any sense and they're not helpful to Atlanta public schools um, not helpful to teachers not helpful to students not helpful to parents um, and are purely driven by politics and I, I think that uh, we have a great delegation, uh, but at the same time, it's also important to for board members to be aware of of who is yes. who may not agree for whatever reason. So that you know, in our interactions and in our conversations with them, we can either inform them or understand where they're coming from in that regard. Because I, I definitely have been surprised by some of the votes. Mm -hmm. um, on some of these bills that you've been paying attention to? It's, it's been consistent for the past year or so, um, but I do think that that is an opportunity for deeper engagement, probably appropriately from board members to their constituents, to their community members. Um, you know, at some point, a part of advocacy is educating and letting people know where our allies are on some issues and where, where people stand when they're when they're opposite our perspectives. Thank you. Mm, Madam Chairwoman, that concludes our presentations. Thank you everyone for your report. Madam General Counsel, is there a need for the board to retreat into executive session? Yes, Madam Chair, you have two student matters to review. Thank you. Is there a motion to enter into executive session to discuss student ma student appeal matters? So moved. Okay, it's been properly moved by Vice Chair Aretta Baldwin, second by Board Member Estevez. Um, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. We will now go into executive session. Thank you all so much for our robust work session today.